Working Cows Podcast, episode 356. This episode is brought to you by the Wine Glass Ranch. This episode is also brought to you by the South Dakota Grassland Coalition. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. This is Clay Conry, host of the Working Cows podcast, recorded exclusively in the Understanding Ag Studios. And this episode is brought to you by the Wine Glass Ranch. Cattlemen, mark your calendars for Wednesday, April 10th, 2024, your opportunity to get your hands on some low input foraging experts from the Wine Glass Ranch. These cattle come from a genetic base of Angus and Hereford Cross. They are a low frame score, three to four, low milk output, easy keeping. These girls work 365 days a year and they are ready to go to work for you. So if you're interested in this, you'll have an opportunity to get your hand on some of the 300 head of bred cows that will sell in April at Oglala Livestock. So mark your calendars for the second Wednesday in April and be on the lookout for more information coming soon. If you're interested, you can get more information at wineglassranchinc.com or emailing info at wineglassranchinc.com. Before we jump into this intro, I did want to let you know, uh, Lord willing, there will be another episode coming out this week on Friday. We'll be releasing an episode with Alejandro Carrillo, and Alejandro is going to join me to talk about uh, just what he's been doing in on his ranch there to really move the needle and change things in an arid climate in the desert in Mexico and some of the changes that he's been able to see. And the reason I'm having him on is because I want to let you know about a upcoming webinar that will be taking place uh in part sponsored by the South Dakota Grassland Coalition to get the uh, word out about drought planning. And the title of the of the webinar is Drought Plan Now or Pay Later. Also be joined by Jim Falstick, who was an, a guest on the Working Cows podcast, had a chance to hear him talk uh, recently, and he talks about the importance of having a disaster plan. Right, We want to have not just a drought plan, but a disaster plan, because it might not be a drought, but it could be a hailstorm that that hails out as in Jim's case, multiple quarters of land and, uh, and, and really throws the, uh, what we can do on this land into flux. So I'm going to be talking to him and there'll be a link in the show notes page for today, working cows.net slash three fifty six to, uh, that, uh, webinar registration page. And I'm looking forward to MC in this webinar coming your way real soon. So find that in the show notes page for today at workingcows.net slash 356. Today's episode, we are excited to be joined by Cal Hartage. Cal is the host of the Grazing Grass podcast. Cal is uh, an individual who jumped in and started a podcast, and he just released uh, episode 100 recently. I was privileged to be a guest on his podcast, and uh, that'll be coming out in in the weeks to come. Uh, if it's not out uh, simultaneously with this episode of Cal on the Working Cows podcast, but uh, also uh, just he has a great format, and it's it gets a different perspective from people who maybe you've heard on other podcasts. So I figured, what the heck, let's run. Cal through his own uh, format on the Working Cows podcast. So I'm I'm stealing Cal's format today, and we're going to use it uh, to learn about Cal and his operation. So Cal, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Clay, I'm excited to be on here today. I I really appreciated the opportunity to join you on on your podcast. It was a it was a fun experience getting to to chat with you a little bit and uh, so thought well we should bring you on and, and get to know you a little bit more uh, with me asking the questions and and one of the ways that uh, I kind of seemed intriguing to me to accomplish that was to follow and I won't do this as well as you have because you're you're nearing or getting ready to release episode 100 uh, but yeah. kind of use the format that you use on your podcast to 
to learn about you and your operation and then talk about a specific practice and then finish up as you do with the famous four questions. So, uh, I guess, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'd like to do today is just get to know you a little bit and, uh, where in the world are you? Well, be, before I even get there, I'm stressing a little bit over this pop quiz of the famous four. I wasn't anticipating it, so I, I've got to think up some good answers. Where in the world am I? I'm in northeast Oklahoma. I am about an hour from Tulsa. So if you were to draw a line halfway between Joplin, Missouri and Tulsa, Oklahoma, you'd get pretty close to me. We have the tall grass prairie coming down on the north side. Uh the Osage, no, sorry, Osage is over to the west. We have the Ozarks, hills and mountains coming in from the east. We're kind of in a transition period, not really a period, but transition area. Our our property here, you go south of us, a little bit more rolling. You go even to the east, you really get some hills there. You go to the north, it turns flat. Wally Olson is a positive individual. Uh, but he one time told me that Northeast Oklahoma was the easiest place in the world to raise a cow. Uh, so what would you what would you say is the unfair advantage of Northeast Oklahoma? Just on Wally. Wally's ranch was like four miles away from me. So um, not too far from me. And I think we have a lot of great positives here. The weather's pretty mild. I mean, it gets warm in summer and we have hot days. And we'll have a few days over 100 degrees, but it's never too terrible. We, our winters are not too bad. We do, get, we do see all four seasons, and we do get a little bit of cold weather, but it's not terrible. Um, we are far enough east that we do experience drought and stuff, but we're, in a, we're about 42, 44 inches of rain annually. And usually, you know, summers are dry, but... Overall, it's not a terrible place to be. I I enjoy it here. Have you spent much time uh, away from there and, and more specifically in the West? Have you spent much time in the West at all? I have not. I do go to a family reunion every other year in Amarillo, Texas. And I, I look at that land and that's where my grandparents moved away from. Um, their parents were out in West Texas and they decided to move to eastern Oklahoma. And that's where our families have been since then. Um, so I do get to see it, but out past um, Amarillo or going out to Denver is about all that I've spent time in that area. And those have not been farm-related trips. We're going to uh, put a pin in the progress here for a second, and I don't know exactly when this episode's going to release, but what do you know? What kind of perspective do you have boots on the ground from uh, the wildfires that have gone through the panhandle of Texas here recently? Uh, as I understand, it's still burning uh, in some cases, uh, not fully out yet. Is that right? R right. And I don't know. it. The lack of information, I think, is really interesting there. We... You know, we were hearing all about it, and then some weather patterns changed and stuff, and I haven't heard much. Now, my dad has talked to his cousins out in West Texas, and I know they have sustained some losses out there. Um, I don't know. I don't think any, anyone has lost everything, but they have sustained losses out there. And when, when I think about that over a million acres— for me, to put it in my perspective, I live in Craig County, Oklahoma. It's a half million acres. Rogers County next to it's a half million acres. So that's like both of those counties being burnt. That's just hard to comprehend for me. Yep. Yep, it is. It is. And uh, obviously, prayers yes. and, and resources to those people. I've seen lots of, lots of resources headed that direction. I've actually... Got a check sitting in my desk right now from the church that I pastor. We had a special business meeting the other night and voted to send some money down there. And so um, just need to write a note and get the money in the, in the, down there. I, I sent, I communicated with a friend of mine um, who's been on the podcast. Justin Rader uh, lives right in Canadian Texas or Hell just yes. northeast of Canadian Texas. And, and it went right through his place and sent me some pretty harrowing videos and things oh, like I that. And so, so um, yeah, and he he provided me with 
uh, some contact information to send it to. And actually, where we're sending this this help is straight to the Canadian Texas Volunteer Fire Department, and they've got a fund set up that's just for ranchers. So if anybody's interested in that, um, I could probably put that address in the show notes page if somebody wanted to send some money that direction uh, or whatever kind of relief efforts they wanted to, they could probably coordinate through that office. But anyways, yeah, I just wanted to check in, see if you had any any further information on that. So I appreciate that. But back to kind of discussion about your operation, uh, what is what is the unique challenge of Northeast Oklahoma, would you say? The unique challenge for me, and I think so many others in this area, is the size of our operations. We're working with much smaller operations. You go north, you get into the ranching area. You go south of me, as you head towards Tulsa, you're much smaller. So you're getting into a lot more, I hate the word hobby farms. And and some of them are hobby farms. On our area, we're not big enough, or I don't think we're big enough. But on the other hand, we're not a hobby farm either. So that causes some issue here is just having enough land. We have a lot of uh, land available, you know, talking to different people and they, they talk about pasture and cropland. We don't have cropland here. Our soils in some places grow b- better rocks than anything else. Um, my dad's place here is really nice and we don't have that rock layer right on the top. We have been able to find it at different times, but it's not too bad here. I lease land um, just a couple miles over, and I'll probably stub my toe as I walk across it. So it just depends on that plate and how it's moved. I think there's a ridge just to the west of us, and if you're east of that ridge, you've got some nice soil. You go um, west of that ridge where that ridge pops up, that's where the rocks Limestone starts popping out of the ground. What? Uh, how did you get started in grass-based livestock production? I grew up on a dairy. We, it, going back even before dairy, we had beef cattle, we had pigs, of course chickens. And then when we we started dairying, I was thirteen years old, and we dairied with my grandparents who had dairied for and for ever, and my uncle also dairied with them. And then shortly after starting with them, that was 85. In 88, dad had purchased land we'd put in. He'd put in his own dairy and we were dairying there. It was around that time I was introduced to a Stockman Grass Farmer and started reading on that and gaining information, wanting information on the more of a New Zealand type um, grazing dairy. So I was chasing that rabbit hole. I graduated high school. In 90, and I went to college, NEO, and then I went to OSU, got an animal science degree. Of course, during that education, I don't remember ever discussing really managing your grass, managing your soil, and growing growing healthier ecosystems. I got home, and I started dairying with my parents. And I was still on that journey. We we started trying to rotate cows a little bit. I read um, intensive grazing. I'm trying to think, it's a red book. I'm sure sure it's a different title. It may be behind me, but I remember reading those books. I was reading Grass Stockman Grass Farmer and just trying to implement it. And it wasn't. It was different than what dad had done and grandpa had done so obviously dad was fine with me doing it as long as i didn't affect milk production negatively so we did a little bit but to be honest i was never very successful with it we i i look back and i think oh i i have a few ideas for it i wasn't doing a very good job i'm still learning still trying to do better but we had a little solar charger did not we were um, putting poly braid, putting insulators on T posts, putting poly wire through it. They ground out really easy anytime you're using a T post. And those little yellow insulators, they'll last a little while, but they don't do too good. And then we weren't grounding the system except we'd hooked a 
alligator clip onto a fence, which is a pretty good ground, but you've got a weakness in that alligator clip. clip. It just doesn't make a good connection. So I'd go out to get the cows and they're out. And so I fought with that some and really didn't make too much progress, to be honest. We, no one else was doing it. I had to be careful because I didn't want to hurt milk production because that was the paycheck. So really didn't change much on that. I tried some and then we ended up selling out in 99. We, we sold out and I went back to school and got an education degree. And with that, I started teaching during those first few years of that. I really took a step back from the farm. I was still providing labor for dad. And um, every summer I had a summer job and dad made sure I had plenty to do. But dad had transitioned to beef cattle at that time. And when we dairied, we had we'd put in a lot of paddocks or a lot of pastures. And dad's always been a believer in moving cattle and that we've got to manage it some way just not quite as intensive as I wanted to. So we had these pastures. Dad got beef cattle. And so often, the gates were just left open, which that's the number one thing. Close a gate. Close the gate. I, I drive down the road. That's a pet peeve. I drive down the road, and I see gates open all the time. And I, I'll be honest. I'm the world's worst about leaving gates open, but it's so I can get to cattle. Not so the cows can go everywhere. So close the gate. And so dad and I had lots of conversations. And slowly over time, he's just turned over the management of the cattle to me. And we have on the place, we have 14 permanent paddock pastures set up. So we've got permanent subdivisions in our pastures and we rotate them. And he is he's on board with that. We rotate them. About weekly, one thing I want to do this year is do a much tighter rotation with his cattle. About five years ago, so I'm doing this all this time. I'm thinking, I'll get the opportunity. I'll buy the cows, buy the farm. I was continuing on, and a couple of things happened about five years ago. I decided if I'm going to do something, I've got to do it. So I had been looking for leased land or land to lease. And that's difficult to find, especially if you're only doing it halfway. I know I can remember asking people when I'd see them about land and nothing ever came of it. And I was really discouraged about that. Um, But about five years ago, I made that paradigm shift in my mind that I'm going to find land to lease. So I changed my approach and I was able to get contracts on three different properties. And with that, I started my own beef herd and with them, They're doing daily rotation. I hate to say daily. At times it's daily. At times it's three days. At times it's a week. It depends on what my needs are for them. But that's really when I dove into it. And shortly after that, because I was doing that, shortly after that, I'm like, I need more people to talk to to, who's doing this. And that led me to the podcast with the Grazing Grass podcast and being able to talk to people, which has just accelerated my learning curve. And going with that. Um, So we have beef cows on dad's herd. We manage one way. We have beef cows I have. And then in addition to the beef cows on dad's place, we have hair sheep. And then I have a handful of meat goats on lease property. What was the change in your approach that led to you being able to secure those leases? The number one thing is talk to the person who makes the decision. I can remember there's a property butts up against my dad's place right here. And I've been, I've talked to the people who own it. Well, let's clarify. I talked to a cousin of the owner. I'm like, Hey, I'd lease it. I'm interested. Whenever I got an opportunity to tell someone, Hey, I'm interested in leasing that. But what I didn't do was go talk to the owner, which I didn't know the owner. Uh, They live in Tulsa and I didn't make that connection. And that's one of the things that spurred me because, so I'm talking to people. I'm like, hey, I'm willing to lease this. I know I mentioned to some of the family members. And then I can remember I had talked to them and like six weeks later, someone had cattle on there. I'm like, what happened? Mm -hmm. 
I didn't talk to the right person. So that's that's the number one thing. If you're talking about leasing land, make, make sure you're talking to the person who makes the decision for the land. Um, so that was the first thing. Secondly, I went around and I, I listened to Bigger Pockets real estate podcasts, and they talk about driving for dollars. And what they call driving for dollars, you're driving around and you're looking for lawns that are uncapped. You're looking for houses that have deferred maintenance. You're looking for absentee owners. So I have an app on my phone and I drive around driving for dollars, but I'm looking for land that is not being maintained. No animals are on it. Hay bales are a year old and they're just sitting there. Fences are down. Something along that line. And then I mark it on the app. Then I look up who's the owner and I contact them, Facebook, phone call. I've even sent letters. So some way to get to the right person about it. That's the two main things. Talk to the right person and then be very proactive. Get out there and look. And the third key is relationships. Um, even even though you make that contact, it's it can't all be about you. And one property I had leased for a couple of years, uh, the reason they leased it to me was because of the rela- relationship I had built with the owner. Uh, he originally told me no. And then later on, I was able to lease it for a while. Right. As Steve Kenyon says, uh, he goes for a lot of tea and cookies <laughs> to maintain lease relationships, you know. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and so uh, yes. Uh, what's the challenge of running on that the lease ground? I mean, to me, it seems to be the challenge of moving, moving from one to the next. Are they all pretty close in proximity or, or is that is it something you got to haul them a ways to get from one place to the next? There, it's not too far, but it's far enough. So I have, so I have properties. I guess the the distance between the properties are only about four miles, so not too bad. <clears throat> and ones at either end, then there's property in the middle. So actually, it's not too bad. But to go out, one one set of property right in the middle is right at the back of my dad's place. And the only road act access, it's a locked in property and it has no um, lo- road access. So the road access is through my dad's place. So I bring the cows out then. Well, that's kind of the wrong side to bring them out. So then to walk them over there, it's three and a half miles, which I've done and works out fine. But it's almost as quick to haul them over, which is a. A debate I have in my mind how to get them back and forth. And if I haul them over, I don't have to worry about any of the places where the fence may not be as good on the path over. Right. Yep, for sure. So that's always always one issue. A second issue is water, like everyone else. Um, two properties I have. When we got dry, was this 24, 23, 22, I had no water on two properties which meant I had to constrict back to one property, which then meant I was overstocked for that property. And did you end up having to destock then? Yes, some. Yep. Well, it's just a really hard mind shift to destock when it gets dry for so long. Um, You know, it gets dry, you kind of can, well, so, so many people just open the gates and let them have everything. But we went, we got dry then, I destocked some, my dad destocked, which that's the first time he had destocked just from conversations about what we should do in that case. And I just think it's a, a hard decision to make. And I really like the people who say, hey, you should have a written plan in place, because when you're in that position, it's hard to make that decision if you don't have it wrote down ahead of time. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, and. If you don't have those trigger dates in line, a lot of times by the time you get to, by the time you realize something needs to be done, it's too late, you know? And so if you have those trigger dates ahead of time, oh yeah, you know, it, you can, you can make those changes in a timely manner. Earlier, you mentioned that you started with T-posts and the clip-on insulators. What was the next kind of infrastructure step that you took and, and where are you at now? For... For dad's place, we went to 
I, I'd buy some, some tread in posts from the local farm stores, which they didn't last. I'd have broken clips on them. It was just awful. Um, and so I ended up ordering O'Brien's tread ins based upon Greg Judy's book, which I think are wonderful. I think I've got one broken one out of all the ones I use. And then we continue to use a solar charger on dad's place. And I just, I can put up solar charger, one strand of wire. It'll run hot enough. I just make sure I have a good ground rod in the ground. I got some of those little three foot T ones that'll work in that particular case. It gives me a better connection than when I was putting it on a rusty T post. Sure. For, for, for lease properties, I have some high tensile strung and then I'm using poly braid and, O'Brien's, a few Gallagher ring tops. I I haven't found, I think, well, just continuing on that, the Gallagher ring tops I love. I've used some other pigtails, and I just don't like them as well. Um, so I'm actually wanting to get a few more of those ring tops. Sure. Uh, you you said you're not in farm country, so do you guys seed anything? Do you, do you plant anything? Yes and no. <laughs> um, we... We broadcast some stuff out. Now, years ago, years ago, interesting, years ago, we wanted more legumes. So dad fed a little bit of clover seed to the cows. And this was, and I say years ago, this is probably 80s. Mm. Well, and I know we were doing it on this place. He, we started dairying here in 88. So I know we were doing it at that time. Um, since then, we will buy some seed and broadcast it from time to time. Uh, I think, well, I think, I know. Dad's got a couple bags of clover seed we hadn't gotten gear and done anything with, which we're getting kind of late for that. But we go out and broadcast it. We did a couple years ago. We'd like to have a pasture drill. They're just so expensive. Mm. So we went and purchased a used grain drill. And I have used it with varying levels of success. The year I used it most extensively to pull, put in some cool season annuals, uh, we were really dry, and I I did not get much out of that. Uh, it's something I would like to do more of on the cool season annuals. We stockpile grass, and we can make it most, not most, part of the winter. I'd like to get the cool seasons in so that we can carry it on to the next point. Sure. Outside of getting rain... <laughs> What's the key to success with broadcasting uh, uh, forage? I I wish I could say. <laughs> um, I don't think I've had a lot of success. I, I go in, I try and graze the area hard, set back that grass a little bit, and also give me a nice area. I have broadcast before I've grazed. I broadcast after I've grazed. Um, either way, it seems like rain is more important than either of those things. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, so this is an uh, an operation based on faith, right? I'm just trusting that this is going in the, in the seed bank and it'll be real good someday. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so I, I cannot speak to a good plan for um, introducing those cool season annuals. Now, the broadcasting has worked well enough that, and to be honest, one year I did five acres right outside my house just to to try a couple of things and broadcast it out there. And I'm like, I didn't get anything out of that. And then when I thought about it, I um, set stock some sheep there for the winter and I never fed them any hay. Mm. So I'm like, well, wait a second. I actually got something out of it and I didn't manage it very good. Mm. Let's take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsor today, the South Dakota Grassland Coalition. If you're in the business of managing livestock, you've probably experienced drought, shortage of time, not enough help, and hefty debt. But facing one or even all of these challenges doesn't have to leave you worrying about how you'll make it through another year. Learn how to increase your stocking rates, extend your grazing season, increase plant diversity, retain moisture in your soil, spend less time and money on weed control, and much more at one of the South Dakota Grassland Coalition's grazing schools. During this three-day intensive program, Area producers, along with presenters from state and local agencies, 
combine hands-on activities in the field with classroom-style presentations to walk you through the steps necessary to create a grazing plan that suits your unique operation. Reserve your spot at one of the three grazing schools today at sdgrass.org. What do you do when you have more forages available than the livestock can graze? I don't run into that problem as often as I would like to. We we do make we do have a custom baler come in and bale about 60 acres on my dad's place. And that's an ongoing discussion him and I about whether or not to bale hay. I would love to move away from it and just bring hay in. He his um, converse to that is that the time we take to haul the hay, it just takes so much time to bring hay in. So right now we're belling that hay. So that typically takes care of our spring flush here on my dad's place. On the other property, I do my best just to certain per- certain areas I can hold the, off that grass and I can let it get ahead and then I can come in and graze it when it gets hot. It's not as good a quality at that point, but I've got grass that I can use. Yeah, and, and are you uh, 50-50 or predominantly cool seasons, warm seasons? Do you have more than more of one than the other? I would say we we have a high percentage of legumes on my dad's place. We have a fair amount of fescue and a fair amount of Bermuda grass. It is not, it's a nice um, polyculture now. Years ago, we were very much fescue on a lot of it. And some of we ha- didn't even have much green or much grass at all because it was reclaimed land. But we have a really nice mix of fescue, clovers, and Bermuda through most of it. Now, 80 acres that was reclaimed and we put fertilizer on, not fertilizer, we put chicken litter on and we have growing good. We don't have as much Bermuda grass or warm season perennials up there as we would like. Um, we do have vetch and sweet clover and lespediza and lots of things like that but we don't have bermuda grass up there sure which so, bermuda grass can really be the backbone of a lot of stuff it's not great but it's it's pretty good right i'm gonna ask a question that'll make everybody in eastern oklahoma and kansas and missouri and everywhere east of there roll their eyes <laughs> say <laughs> i'm gonna ask you a question about <clears throat> about uh fescue um is all fescue susceptible to endophyte infection? I think even if you plant the the endophyte free fescue, eventually it's going to turn to the effect of I'm not a hundred percent sure because we've never even fought that battle. We um fescue works out really nice for wintering, for stockpiling. It's a valuable forage for us. And for the most part, we have not seen too many detrimental effects of it. Now, we have seen some. I'm not saying it's all been um, wine and rose-colored glasses, but um, it's it's pretty valuable the way it is. Now, if they could get the, the end of fight free version to work really good and stay that way, it might be an interesting discussion. Yeah. Do you think that the reason that you haven't had an issue with it is because you're not grazing down low? You're not grazing it down far enough to get to that? Or, um, you know, is it something else? Or do you do you have a guess? I would like to say I've never grazed it too low and got into that problem, but um, I have grazed it too low. I'm as susceptible as everyone else. So I, I have at times, especially on my dad's place more app. We, um, a few years ago, we decided to expand the herd. And we expanded it too much, and I abused one of the pastors, and I'm still recovering from that abuse we did on that pastor. What I contribute it to more is cow genetics um, in that the cows, when dad purchased cows, uh, they came from cell barns around here, something cheap, got us started. When we purchased bulls, we purchased locally produced bulls that came from fescue, and just that selection, and then as we we follow the Lassiter philosophy on cattle ranching, and if a cow doesn't wean a calf, she goes to town. And I think that over the years 
have really made a difference because those cows who can't handle fescue are moved out of the system. Sure. How are you handling replacements? Do you keep your own? We do. And that is a discussion as well, because so much of what that's the great thing about dad and I doing this together and across the fence. We have these great discussions about what we should be doing, and we don't always agree upon them, but it's great to have that discussion. And and one of the current discussions we have are, are is about replacement heifers. Uh, replacement heifer success is part of the reason we've changed dad's cow herd up. We were running into some problem of not getting them bred on time because we want that first calf at 24 months. And we... We decided part of the problem was the genetics we were using. And we were going full-blood limousine bulls, and we'd been doing that for a long time. Our cows were getting pretty good size, and um, we started running into problems where our replacement heifers weren't breeding on time. It's probably due to a lot of factors, but one thing we pointed out was the breeds we were using. So we changed that up to go to a more moderate sized cow. And we had already started that process with the limousines and that we were selecting more moderate sized limousine bulls. But we've, we've reduced that size even more. And dad's herd going across the scales probably will average 1100. Mm, wow. And my, my cows are, are a little smaller and I have a high percentage of um, Corriente cows right now, so my cows may struggle to average 900 right mm-hmm. now if I put them on a spreadsheet. <laughs> nice. Very good. So uh, how do you handle winter? You mentioned a little bit uh, some different winter scenarios that you've been in. Uh, how do you guys handle uh, managing for winter? So we try to – we pull off certain parts of the land, certain parts of the land that has the better fescue on it. And we try to stockpile that. We we try and pull off of that August 1st at the latest. It depends on summer, what that date is. But we try and pull that off. Pull off then. If we get adequate rain during the fall, we will be good. Or I say good. We will have a nice stockpile of fescue. If we don't get adequate rain, um, we won't have quite, a, quite as good a stockpile. And, and then... We we move to those pastures once we're out of grass elsewhere and we graze fescue. And we haven't, and this is a very low bar, but we haven't fed hay before the first of the year in 10 years or maybe even longer because we've done that so long. Now, the the next step for us is to get that further into the year. And I think we started feeding I want to say January 15th this year for dad's herd. My herd, I had to feed a little bit earlier because of a mistake I made. (laughs) But that's, you know, it happens. Yep. Um, The great thing is, so we feed the hay, we we pull off the land here. We, I was going to say very rarely, we don't buy any hay. We produce all the hay we need. And we have old chicken houses so we put them in the chicken houses and those hay or that hay will store in there so nice. It doesn't matter if we pull it out two, three years later. It may be a little bit more dusty, um, but it is still great quality. What kind of equipment do you use then? We, um, we, we have a custom baler in. The day we sold haying equipment was one of my favorite days ever. And uh, he's using all Ford tractors and... I want to say he's got a John Deere baler. I'm not sure right off what baler he's using. I am just so glad I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> For sure. So you guys, uh, yeah, as far as feeding the hay, what kind of equipment? Just the tractor? or? Yeah, we have a Kubota tractor and we take it out. And we, we feed hay in different ways. Uh, you know, bell grazing is all the, the rage right now. Everybody's talking about bell grazing. We... We used to use hay rings. We moved away from hay rings just because they tear up. We we use hay when we feed it as a way to improve the land. And I know people talk about unrolling hay and bell grazing to do that. We did it to stop ditches. So some erosion, some places, we fed hay. In fact, we had to stop feeding hay there because it got 
too nice and too soft. Mm. And um, so when we'd go out and feed hay, we would put it in those ditches first. We still use a hay trailer in one spot that we have on concrete pad that we feed at times. And then we also have a bell unroller that we built. So sometimes we unroll. Sure. Typically what we do, we, we take a lazy approach to it. We take, we say it's Saturday, we go out and put out a lot of hay. And we put them in each pasture. We'll put four or five bells in each pasture. And then we just rotate the cows through them as they finish the hay. It's a very easy way to do it. It takes a few hours on that day whenever we do it, but then it's just opening gates. And that means when it gets really cold out, we always plan ahead and we don't have to go feed hay on those days. And on those days, it's just a matter of opening a gate if they need new, new hay and it's cutting ice, but not much you can do about that. And we do have a couple of bigger ponds that don't freeze as quick. So we try and utilize those when the weather is going to get bad and we try and put hay there so we don't have to cut as much ice or feed any hay. And I say that that's dad's place. My place is a little bit different because those cows, um, I'm unrolling almost all the hay I'm putting out for them. And I'm I'm using lease property and that land has not been taken care of. Uh, one property was hayed for years. If broom sedge was worth something, I'd be rich. <laughs> Um, so it's a, so I'm trying to improve that land more than what we're trying to do on dad's. Mm. Now we did have, we've got one pasture, we call it no lake pasture because we had a, about a seven acre pond on it and the co-company dug, needed to put a road across us to get to some land they were digging. And we did that and they also filled in that lake. So sure. that pasture, but then the problem was we didn't have enough topsoil to put back on. So we're building that pasture up and, and that pasture, we're unrolling hay or we're putting it out there and letting them leave a lot of litter on it. Because we don't ever, you know, we've always had enough hay. So we're not going out there and saying, oh, you've got to eat every bit of this before we move on. So we're okay with wasting some hay and leaving it on the ground. We know we're doing it. We know by putting out all these bells, four or five bells in a pasture, and then doing it a half dozen pastures, we know that's costing us some. But we feel like the trade-off's worth it for us. Because when it's cold and everyone else is running down the road putting hay out, we're not. Mm -hmm. Yep. For sure. Yeah, no, I think that there's a, a lot of advantages to doing things that way. Absolutely. Um, what are some of your goals for the next few years? I would like to to double or triple the land base I have with my with my operation. Um, Driving for dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So I've recently, you know, gone full time on the farm and podcasts. And um, the farm is not really big enough to sustain me but it's created some urgency here so i need to get some more property and i've already like i mentioned i've got an app and i've got all these pins on it of all these properties i've got to look up and start the process conversation and work towards that um, for for my herd is just continue um there's some debate i say debate it's mainly in my head my wife listens to me but at times, I think I ought to sell my cows. Um, the prices right now, I'm not sure I can justify keeping them. Right. Um, because I'm not going to go out and buy cows for that price. And if I could turn them into an undervalued class of animals, um, that's, that's the debate I'm currently having with, with my personal cows um, actually, I say that dad and I talked about it, too, with his cows. Should we transition to a stalker program? Should we um, do some of each, which I think is probably the more the point we want to get to? The, the thing that really makes it difficult, that decision, we've always had cows. I love the breeding aspect of it. I love knowing this is out of mm -hmm. whoever. 414 and this and 414 is out of so-and-so and this bull. 
I love that aspect of it. Um, coming from dairy industry and we AI'd everything. I love that um, genealogy of the cattle and knowing them. So that makes it really tough when I think about selling my cows. At the other side of it is if I'm not profitable, the farm is not sustainable. So when you look at that and you start looking at numbers, I'm doing okay. I could do better, maybe with stalkers or maybe a different class or changing my focus just a little bit. So I'm I'm trying to figure all that out. And as I think about trying things, um, a funny story on that, dad and I tried stalkers a few years ago, just a small set. We purchased black heifers, um, black sell a little bit better here. Um, yellows are pretty p- hot right now. Uh, reds, reds are pretty good on the heifer side. And would the yellow be a, a red cow and a Charlotte bull? Yes. Yes, it is. There's a fair amount of people doing Charlotte on reds or or even smoke-colored calves aren't as bad docked as they used to be. Uh, Charlotte has gained some ground. So we purchased these black heifers, and we started, and we kept them. We overwintered them one year and sold them in the spring. Dad had bought this heifer that had a little bit of white on it and no ears. Its ears had gotten chewed off as a calf. And I forget, he paid like 20 cents a pound for it. It was something crazy. And this, so we're getting ready to sell these, and we're, we're thinking about them going through a ring. And we're thinking, I don't think we want to send her right now. We don't want her to hurt the quality of everything else. So we, we cut her off, kept her back. Well, you know, as things happen, time goes by. We're preg checking, and she's big enough, so we thought we better preg check her. And she was bred. I ended up buying her off of dad for too much money. <laughs> um, and But I have to say, she is one of my best cows. It's just crazy. Um, I, even now, she'd get docked terribly for the way she looks, but she raises a nice calf. <laughs> yep. Have you been through Wally's marketing school? I haven't. Okay, so he talks about that. And actually, I broke down driving to Wally's marketing school. And so I didn't oh, get there yes. for the morning. But uh, he he talks about his favorite cow. And it's this heifer that jumped the fence in with the neighbor's bull and got bred early and had a calf and then has calved every year since then. And, and all these other things that were stacked against her. And then he sold her when the market was high. And, you know, I mean, that's his favorite cow. Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, Wally School is on my list to attend. I'd like to go to Doug's um, Ferguson School as well. Mm-hmm. Um, haven't got all that done yet. All that w- was a long ways to say the direction we're heading with the farm. Uh, one aspect are hair sheep, and we have just been the last few years increasing that flock. Now, right now, we're thinking we're at a point we will hold steady. So we'll probably sell some ewe lambs this year as, in addition to the ram lambs. Um, but the sheep, the sheep had a steep learning curve. They are doing fairly well, but it's still a learning process with sheep. Um, we, we ran into some problems last year through management. Most of our issues are management and I take full blame for it, but hopefully I reflect upon it and learn from it. Um, I'm with you. So we've got the sheep about 150 ewes right now. And I think that's where we're we're going to stick with the sheep for the foreseeable future. But again, that's that's fluid as we think about what class of livestock is performing better and bringing in more money. And I, I hate to say it that way, bringing in more money. It's the class of livestock that's leaving more money in our mm. pocket. Yeah, generating because value. Because it may not be the, yeah, it may not be the one that sells for the highest. But if the expenses are really low, then that's another consideration. I've heard you talk about the sale ring and, and, and selling that way. Is that the main way that you're marketing products? Yes. Um, years ago when we were really focused on limousine, we were selling to Laura's Lean Beef, mm. and we were providing a different product then. Uh, we were feeding them out, getting them bigger. And they concluded they were driving up here out of Texas and hitting three farms in this area that I knew of. And they decided it wasn't worth it for that one load. Sure. So now it's all the sale barn. All the sale barn right now, yes. 
when we as we move to the overgrazing section, it's tempting to uh, talk about your your multi species practices, um, but I think we'll save that for some bonus content if that's all right. And the practice that has intrigued me the most throughout this entire conversation is the number of times you mentioned the conversations and the ongoing conversations with your dad. And so if you don't mind, I'd like to take a little bit of a deeper dive into that. So tell me about the context in which those conversations happen. Where where are you at when you're having these conversations? Usually I get a phone call every morning from dad. Now, I didn't get one today because he's... he's um, he had a doctor's appointment, but we usually talk for 30 minutes to 45 minutes on those daily calls. He lives two miles down the road. So I see him all the time. My wife makes a lot of fun of us because she'll be like, why is your dad calling? Didn't you spend all day with him? And so that's one communication tool we have that we have those daily phone calls or almost daily phone calls. And then we're out on the farm. We look at cows. We look at grass. We look at pastures. And those conversations are just ongoing all the time. He will call and to say, hey, do you see the latest market report? Did you see this? Um, he loves to – he has figured out how to use Siri on his phone to send texts, and then I have to interpret them <laughs> or translate them to what it really should be, which is always fun. But – you know, that relationship, I'm 51, uh, dad is 76, and I would like to say it's always been like that, but it, it's not. It's taken a long time to get here, um, but now we have lots of conversation about the farm and where we're heading. I I know my place in the, on dad's place, it's his place, and I'm providing suggestions, and he's making the final call on that. Um I, I show him my cattle and tell him what I'm doing there, and sometimes he tells me I'm crazy. <laughs> but um, we're it, it's great to have that person that you can talk to, and both working towards a pretty uh, maybe not the same exact goal, but pretty similar goals. Yeah. What do you think are the keys to getting to the point where he's ready to? try something new or, or make a change or, you know, uh, whatever that, whatever it is, bringing in hair sheep, selling cows, destocking, what kind of, how do you go about having that conversation to the point that he's ready to, to, to bite the bullet? I handled it the same way that I convinced my wife that this farm trip is a vacation. <laughs> I talk about it until they give in. <laughs> Actually, that that's more of a joke, but it's actually along that line because we talk about it and we talk about it. You know, one thing I talk about in the podcast, we hear these stories, these journeys, and they're a lot of times they're similar, but they're never they're never the same. But the goal is that someone connects with that person's story and it encourages them to take that next step. And that person may talk about a practice that we've talked about on 90% of the episodes, but for some reason, they connected and they th think, oh, that's what I should do. Um, getting sheep, it took four years of conversations and looking before we got hair sheep. I went to a conference in 2011 uh, for small ruminants up in Jefferson City, Missouri, and I was the only person there that only had meat goats. And at the time, I was running about 50 head of meat goats. Everyone else there had hair sheep only or hair sheep and meat goats. And I came home from that thinking we need some hair sheep. And so dad and I talked about it, talked about it, talked about it, talked about it. And, and you know, once we've talked about it a few times, he starts paying attention, starts researching it on his own. And um, then we decided, OK, we'll, we'll buy some, we'll try it. And then we spent a long time looking for a flock to buy. So I think just having those conversations and I, I like to to tell my wife, I can't even think what it was. I told her the other day, I just put the bug in dad's ear today. So this is an ongoing conversation. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it sounds to me like the key to success there is your patience and his open mindedness. Yes, and I will say it has not always been that way. He 
he he is very much the boss of his land, and I accept that. Uh, 30 years ago, I was a lot more stubborn, and I thought I should have a lot more say. And he was not as flexible and as patient and open-minded. Um, it's taken us a while to get there. And it, it means sometimes there was bumps in the journey. Sometimes we weren't very happy with each other. But then again, we just continued on. We just we weren't very happy with each other the other day setting some corner posts. We decide, we both had different opinions on how it should be done. Of course, I knew my place, so I went ahead and did it the way he wanted it done. <laughs> yep, very good. Okay, so uh, we're going to move on to the famous four questions. Uh, I know you said you were a little intimidated at the, at the start, but I'll... I'll, <laughs> yes. I'll uh, I, and honestly, it was the most intimidating portion of being on your podcast, too, trying to think of, uh, again, uh, how I was going to answer those questions. Um, so I'll I'll prime the pump maybe a little bit, give you a little more time to think about it, by asking, was the red book that you were talking about, was it Time for a Change or Time for Change by um, Chip Hines? No, it no. wasn't. It was... Actually, I found it. Oh. I had the title completely wrong. Dollars and Cents. By Larry Trenno, hmm. published in '94. So I had just purchased this when we came back. Um, when I came back home to Derry. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds like a good one. Okay. So, what is your favorite grazing grass related book or resource? I I am a avid reader. Well, I'm an avid book buyer, <laughs> and I try to be an avid reader. Um. You can't see in here. I've got three bookcases plus the books behind me and not all of them's farm. I've got I'm caught quite eccentric on some of my readings, but I love to read and gain knowledge. I, I just feel like that's a powerful tool. You build that relationship. And I hate to even admit what my favorite book is because the, my favorite book is the one that spurred me into action. And that's Greg Judy's No Risk Ranching. I had read these other books. Um, Greg Judy's very pragmatic about it. He tells you how you should do it. And at that point, I was in a little bit of analysis paralysis. And I needed go do this like this. And then then you can reflect upon it and make changes. Um, but that book is probably what spoke to me the most. And I've reread it a number of times. And it took me a while to implement that. And I don't do any custom grazing, but I, I do know it's on the radar. But just getting using lease land to do it. And that really probably spurred me into action. Uh, there's lots of other books that have been really good that I've really enjoyed. Um, Dave Pratt's book, uh, Ranching Turnaround. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Turnaround or Rancher Story or something. Something like that. Really good book. He he introduced some ideas in there that I hadn't had before about how to figure up costs and stuff. So it's very that was a really good one that causes me to want to go to ranching for profit. I've not gone yet, but it is somewhere I'd like to go soon. I'm trying to think, I'm thinking that's probably uh, top two. I've got Managing Pastors by Dale Strickland. I love that book. It's not really a uh, you just read through it. It is a reference book that I go back to, and oftentimes it's on my desk because I'm looking up something. Yeah, as far as ranching for profit and the economic analysis of this there, I think it's unparalleled in its simplicity and Ill ability to give you really good uh, information from which you can make a decision. So, yeah, there's another plug for, as Brian Alexander would say, the school that shall not be named. But uh, anyways. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, what tool could you not live without on your farm? You know, a, a second one, I hate to say this because it's so, um, so cliche, cliche. I can't even say that. So <laughs> it, you know, poly braid, reels, tread in posts, energizer. On my dad's place, we can we can manage without that. Permanent subdivisions, great to go. On lease property, I've got a high tensile feeder wire, basically, that down one side of one place, another I've got down the middle of it. Those are both long-term leases. 
stuff I don't have a long-term lease in, I just go on there with my uh, solar charger, solar energizer, and it's it's a Cyclops. And it's got a marine deep cycle battery on it, so it's a nice setup, and um, poly braid and tread in post and reels, and it's amazing how I can manage cows using that. Yep. So, so that was like five tools, <laughs> but that set just changes what I'm able to do. And it's so cliche for a grazing person to say that, but I really have to say those really make the difference for me. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think uh, I'll never forget um, here the way the way that Joel Salatin put it, he said, black plastic pipe is almost a miracle <laughs> in, in what it did. For oh, ranching, yes. You know, so. Oh, I, yeah. I think poly, poly wire is the same to me, honestly. Um, uh, high oh, tensile yeah. wire, too, for one thing. I mean, you can build, I, uh, what am I, I'm hearing materials. I think materials for a mile of four barbed wire fence in my neighborhood is is $3,600. Um, I think if you have somebody come in and build it, you're looking at more like ten thousand dollars for a mile of high tensile. Oh, yeah, I think we were less than four hundred dollars for a mile, uh, not a mile of high tensile mile of four barbed wire, ten thousand dollars. I think we were less than four hundred dollars for the materials for a, a single strand of high tensile. So I mean, it, it's just oh yeah, kind of uncomparable. And and honestly, as good at containing cattle if you've got them trained to it, they they don't. They don't oh, test yeah. them. So now one thing on that, we do not see any high tensile wire around here. No high tensile fencing. It's all bob wire. Yep, it is here too. It is here too. Yep, yeah. for sure. So what advice would you give to a beginning grass farmer? Listen to the Grazing Grass pro- podcast. That's my advice. Yes, exactly. Done. Actually, the advice I would give is the 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 advice that I needed. And and that's part of the reason I like that no risk ranching. It's to get started. It doesn't matter how much you know or how little you know or what you're doing. Just get started. Um, I got into that analysis paralysis they talk about in real estate. And I'm like, I know what I should be doing, but I don't know. How big should this paddock be? How big? How how big? It's how far should I put post apart? How how far from the ground should it be? It doesn't matter. Just go try it. Right. And if it works, put a check mark by it or highlight it. If it doesn't work, draw a line through it and try something else. Mm-hmm. It the most important thing to me, I, I think there's lots of things to getting started. A mentor is tremendously beneficial, having someone to talk to, someone to to point out blind spots for you. Researching, reading, using YouTube, using podcasts. To gain information, I think it's all all very valuable. But I think the most important step is to get started. Go out there and try it. Just try something. Um, If you give them too, if you give your animals too little of grass, you have a couple of things that may happen. One, they may be hungry when you go out there. That you can solve by giving them more grass the next day. The second thing is they're out. Well, you're just putting a uh, poly wire up, well, give them more area so they don't have to get out to get the grass they need and also check the voltage on that poly wire because if it's hot enough, they're not going to get out. <laughs> yep, for sure. Uh, Jason Mock, one of the best quotes uh, of, on the Working Cows podcast, perfect is the enemy of done. And if we wait till we yes. can do it perfectly, we will do nothing. So. I, I struggle with that because I always think I've got to I've got to know everything. I've got to to have this information. I've got to do it right. I don't have to do it right. Um, my wife tells me a lot of times I don't do it right. So I'm just coming to terms with that. You sometimes need to hear it from somebody else, and then it and it becomes more clear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But and, and just just in full transparency, my wife is wonderful. She puts up with me. She is wonderful. But <laughs> yep. Nope. I uh, yeah. It's the be- It's one of the best quotes because it's the one I need to hear because I am the same way. Oh, yeah. I'm, I am paralyzed by, am I doing it right? Is it, you know, I won't do it because I can't do it right. And so, yeah, for sure. Right. And you get into that imposter syndrome also. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. 
If if you don't feel like you know enough about it, you're like, why am I even trying this yet? Um, just on the podcast, why am who am I to push out a podcast? That's why I bring on guests so people don't have to listen to me. <laughs> Same. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna ask you the last question here. Uh, before I do that, though, if you've enjoyed the format today, I totally, as I said at the beginning, I totally ripped it off from Cal's podcast. Um, I was just being a lazy podcaster here today and thought, what the heck? Let's run Cal through his own through his own format. So, if you enjoyed the format today with the introduction to the operation, the overgrazing section, taking a deep dive on a specific practice, and then these famous four questions, go check out Cal's podcast, The Grazing Grass Podcast. It's a great resource and really appreciate him doing the work to put it out. Uh, I think by the time this comes out, episode 100 will have released. So did you did you land on yes. who that was? Yes. Jim Garish is on for episode 100. Nice. Very good. Who who else, right? Who else do you have on episode 100 other than Jim Garrish, of course? <laughs> right. I, I thought, yeah, had to be him. And so we got it recorded. It's ready. Um, of course, we're recording this. Next week will be the 100th episode. Of course, when this gets published, the 100th episode will already been out. Very good. Where can others find uh, more about you? For the podcast, any podcast app that you use to consume podcasts, the Grazing Grass podcast should be there. If it's not, I would love an email and told so I can fix that. And then our website is grazinggrass.com. Uh, we're on most social media, uh, Instagram, threads, Facebook, it's Grazing Grass. We also have the Grazing Grass community Facebook group. And then on Twitter, someone already had Grazing Grass, so we're grazing underscore grass. As for my personal farm, it's Hedge Apple Acres, and I have not, the website's completely down because I decide I'm doing something different with it. But we are on all social media, and I post there at least twice a year. <laughs> Very good, Cal. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me on. I've enjoyed it. Very good stuff there with Cal. Really appreciate his perspective and the way that he goes about sharing it, especially appreciate uh, the way that he talked about him and his dad and the process that they've gone through for making decisions and changes and just the importance of continuing to keep up those uh, communication channels and the process that they've gone through of getting better at it over time. Really, really enjoyed that. As I said, coming up uh, later this week, Lord willing, there will be an episode with Alejandro Carrillo and uh, talking about the webinar that is linked in the show notes page for today at workingcows.net slash 356. After that, we will be talking to Brent Davis. Brent is a horse trainer, a YouTuber, and has a great Patreon where he talks about training horses. And he and I are on similar uh, life stages with young kids and trying to keep them mounted. So I figured, what the heck, let's have a practical discussion about how do we go about keeping young families mounted. So coming up on the Working Cows podcast, we'll be talking to him and Alejandro Carrillo. We'll see you again real soon with another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.